everyone. Hope you're having a great conference so far. I'm here to introduce Dr. Emily Deans. She is a psychiatrist searching for evolutionary solutions to today's mental health problems. She feels that by studying evolutionary medicine, we come closer to the answers for optimal conditions for health and vitality. Uh, you can find her blogs at Evolutionary Psycho Psychiatry as well as Psychology Today. Dr. Emily Deans. Hi. Um, so happy to be here at PaleoFX again. Um, I've actually been to every single one. I've honored and It's really great to see how big the conference has grown. Um, so my talk is really about um, something a little bit different than diet for once. Um, I'm here to talk about the microbiome and how it influences behavior. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a complete sort of prescription solution for humans now um, for the microbiome and behavior. So I'm going to really talk about some of the data that we do have. And I'm also going to talk and mention in this talk a lot of, about autoimmune disease like MS or eczema and things like that. And the reason this talk is going to be in here, because we do have a lot of data about the microbiome um, and those diseases and seeing how that could maybe um, impact how our immune system works with things. And, and that's why you're going to see mentions of those other diseases in this talk about the brain. So parasites in the microbiome, um, they co-evolved with us for millions of years. And it's really at the bleeding edge of health research right now. It's finally possible with modern scientific techniques. And let's get to an understanding of what we do know. Um, I am a blogger at Psychology Today, and I do get paid for that blog. I am not paid for the evolutionarypsychiatry.blogspot.com blog. And in this talk, I will be discussing off-label use of certain supplements and creatures. Um, so this slide is really all about inflammation and how inflammation and how our immune system affects the brain. So that cell at the bottom there is a white blood cell. And all those little chemicals are the, are the way that the white blood cells in the immune system communicates with the brain. Um, and this is how we do connect the microbiome and behavior. And the microbiome is actually a huge part of our immune system and is the front lines. Um, a microbiome that is out of whack can be less effective against insults coming in. And also via leaky gut and direct neural and hormonal mechanisms can affect how we react to stress. So if anybody saw that last talk, Chris Crusher was talking about adrenal fatigue and the um, HPA axis, and that is our stress response system, and this is exactly how the microbiome affects um, our behavior and our mental health. So psychopathology is modulated by inflammation, and this is how the immune system interacts with the brain and environmental stressors, and if it's too much of this, these, this sort of orange-yellow side, you get inflammation, you get a state of neurotoxicity, it's hard for your brain to recover and repair. Um, and the microbiome and behavior and general health is a huge and very sexy topic right now. This is just something that I got. You are your microbiome. And it's so sexy that actually some of our, my academic papers are actually apologetic. So this is the very first line of the abstract. Despite the hyperbole often linked with the popular research field, the scientific rationale for probiotics is sound. And when I'm talking about the microbiota and I'm talking about um, how it regulates the immune system, I'm really going back to a reformulation of what used to be called the hygiene hypothesis. Now, the hygiene hypothesis is this idea that because you know, our mom or our dad, we made things so clean, that now we're sick, so we have MS, we have lots of autoimmune disease, we have huge exp exponential growth of allergies and asthma. It's not actually that simple. Um, a lot of our modern diseases, like I'm actually getting over some sort of pneumonia right now, um, these modern diseases are actually as modern as agriculture. We've co-evolved with them for the last few thousand years. But with these old friends, we've actually co-evolved with them for millions and millions of years. And these um, modulate our immune system. And there's three different kinds. The commensal bacteria, um, those are the ones that live in us and they can't live without us. The pseudocommensal organisms, those, they don't live in us, but they're passing through all the time. And then the third part are the helminths and the eukaryotic parasites, which are tapeworms and blastocysts and fun stuff like that. So the key point, how can we tell an old friend from a pathogen? An old friend is anti-inflammatory and a pathogen is inflammatory. 
And so these um, beasties will act as our external immune system. It's in our bodies, but it's still external because it's in the gut lumen. And they protect us and from and ameliorate the effect of pathogens. Um, so these, all these old friends also have, have a very powerful effect on immune surveillance and cancer. And this is a graph um, from a very famous paper showing just the increase in autoimmune disease since the 1950s. So changes in our microbiota and changes in lack of pathogens and lack of parasites in this last, particularly since 1975, has had a huge effect um, on our risk of some of these autoimmune diseases and probably our mental health as well. So we have an increased risk of melanoma and other cancers, a vastly increased risk of autoimmune disease, that's allergies, eczema, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, MS, but also many gut, skin, and vascular diseases, fat storage diseases, and brain pathology in general. So just um, hay fever, inflammatory bowel disease, and multiple sclerosis have all increased two to three-fold in industrialized nations between 1950 and the present. And since psych diagnosis, um, psych diseases are also mediated by inflammation, there's also been a concomitant increase in psychiatric diagnoses um, from 1950 to the present. Psychiatric, it's a little bit harder to say. There's more sort of knowledge about what is going on. People talk about it a little bit more, so that may sort of falsely increase the amount of diagnosis that, that, that's out there. But there is some um, evidence that it actually we do have increased incidence of these diseases. So where did our study of the microbiota begin? It's actually a really long time ago. This is Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who looked through one of his very early microscopes at a tooth scraping, and he saw these little living animalcules very prettily moving. And that's kind of where things stayed for about the next 300 years, because until we could really have modern um, PCR, modern genetic sequencing, uh, fish techniques, things like that, we really, and also germ-free mice, we really couldn't study a lot of these um, organisms because they live within us and you can't actually culture them. A lot of what we know a lot about, like our, some of our pathogens, is because we actually can take them out and culture them on an agar plate. But many of them, all we know about them is their DNA. So we have a hundred trillion, that's 10 to the 14th to 10 to the 15th microorganisms in our body. Um, the most, we know the most about lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. It's 90% of our cells, so you are only 10% you. 90% of you is, um, are the little beasties who live within and on you. And it's actually 150 times as many genes as our own genome. And it affects everything. It actually, the type of bacteria you have in your gut affects how you um, metabolize even medications and food that you take and food that you eat. Most of the research was done in isolated strains. Now scientists are study, studying them as communities. Um, and they compete with pathogens for space and nutrients. They fortify the intestinal barrier. barrier. And you'll see this because germ-free mice are more susceptible to infections and have deficits in the maturation of their immune system. But who cares? The vast majority live in the colon down there, and the brain is up here. Well, this is the gut-brain axis. So this really shows two of the three, three ways in which the microbes communicate with the brain. So they can communicate via the immune system, so via an inflammation with these white blood cells. So there's our gut pathogens, our little white blood cells. And if they get fired up by seeing some pathogens, they send signals to the brain, which is a stress signal to the brain. And that basically starts this whole, again, this HPA axis. If this gets, the stress response system gets overactivated chronically, you end up with depression, anxiety, um, or things that some people in the paleo community will call adrenal fatigue. And so all of these, the IL-6, the IL-1, they upregulate the stress response. So how do we know this? It's basically via the study of these germ-free mice. You can give mountains of antibiotics to a germ-free mouse and uh, not affect behavior. If you give antibiotics to a normal mouse, you can actually change whether how anxious they are in response to certain stimuli. Um, other rodent studies have shown the judicious application of probiotics can lead to reduced anxiety. In probiotic studies on humans, the same effect has been seen in small studies. Usually, they've been done in cancer patients. Um, in very recent randomized controlled trial actually came out last week or the week before. Um, from Denmark. They used a probiotic called Ecologic Barrier, which I think is kind of a cool name, um, as a daily formulation. It led to significantly decreased aggressive thoughts and ruminative thoughts in healthy young women. 
Um, decreasing rumination is important because it's this rumination that's sort of the beginning of psychopathology. If you can't get worries out of your head, if you just let them stick and go around and around and around, then you can't sleep. They think that is really sort of the beginning um, sometimes of a depressive or an anxiety disorder. And you can actually short circuit that rumination with probiotics in humans. So here is the um, gut-brain axis. Um, and what's interesting about this slide is that when we talk about antidepressants, antidepressants work on this exact system, but up in the brain. Um, so antidepressants will really change that place where you take the amino acid tryptophan, you're supposed to make it into serotonin, um, which helps with neuroregeneration and neuro-repair and helps you recover. But if you're in a stress response, you actually make it into another chemical called chiorinine. And um, chiorinine seems to be neurotoxic. It's kind of like a whip that keeps whipping your brain. Go, 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 go. And you don't get that recovery and repair. So antidepressants, when they do work, they work in the brain to help increase that cycle so you're making, sending more on that serotonin way and less that chiorinine way. And probiotics do exactly the same thing, but they intervene way down at the bottom. So we have gut pathogens, the probiotics can compete with them, they can sort of outcompete these gut pathogens, they can control our immune response to them. And so these would have a very similar, perhaps a similar action um, as antidepressants, but without all those nasty side effects. So again, in mouse studies, killing gut pathogens with antibiotics, so the application of probiotics has been shown to ameliorate this upregulation of the stress response, leading to less anxious behavior in mice. And um, this bifidobacterium and the lactobacillus in mental health applications tend to make you less anxious in both mouse, in mice and humans. Um, and what they're really working on right now are different mixes of these, like that ecologic barrier, or even uh, sort of genetically modified organisms, which sounds kind of scary, but they're really trying to make that so they can charge a lot of money for them. And this new um, science in um, psychiatry is called psychobiotics, which I think would make a great band for like Paleo FX16. <laughs> so there's definitely, and this is the third way, I mentioned two ways, so the endocrine and um, inflammatory ways in which um, the microbiota communicates with our brain. There's actually a third way they communicate directly. So these are all these, um, um, so you take a mouse away from her mother, the gut flora is altered. Um, stress and sleep deprivation affects your gut flora. Um, in people with major depressive disorders, they have increased bacterial signal in the serum of your blood um, as if where it shouldn't be. And again, major depression we're taught is up here. But if you, if you grab a blood sample of someone, you show increased sort of signal of bacteria in their blood where it shouldn't be. It should really be kept inside your um, large intestine. And we also have, again, 200 to 600 million neurons directly connecting the gut and the brain. And they have a common language. These gut bacteria actually produce neurotransmitters that are the same neurotransmitters that we produce. And so I always wonder, what, what are they whispering to us? And I hope it's nice and calming. Um, it makes us happy. Uh, and how they converse with us is actually this big um, cranial nerve called the, called the vagus nerve. It goes down from our brain right down to our guts. And then there's millions and millions and millions of nerve endings on this nerve. And the, um, if you cut this nerve in a mouse, you can stop this communication between the gut bacteria and the brain. So the next type, this is my daughter, who's now five, believe it or not. Um, but almost all of us eat a lot of dirt before we are two years old. And why do we do that? Well, part of this reason may be um, this, uh, this is not the commensal organisms which live in our gut. These are the pseudocommensals which pass through our gut all the time. Um, they're primarily called saprophytic mycobacterial species, and they're found in dirt. With the availability of plumbing and clean water, we no longer consume large amounts of them. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, though. Cholera is no fun. Giardia is no fun. There's, you know, modern plumbing is a terrific invention. But we really want to know, okay, how can we use our scientific know-how and kind of step back a little bit, and how do we say, okay, m having mycobacteria pass through us on a regular basis may train our immune system, may make us healthier. So what can we do about that? And then the third kind of old friend are helminths and our eukaryotic parasites. Prior to 1975, I hope they don't look like that, 
most children in America had exposure to pinworms, um, and thereafter in 1975 uh, was when autoimmune disease began to run rampant. In the developing world, however, you know, parasites are very deadly. 50,000 children a year in Africa die from hookworms, more from schistosomiasis. Um, but one thing happens, it's very common in Africa, for example, to deworm pregnant women to avoid many of these um, childhood deaths. Um, but when you do that, you actually have skyrocket skyrocketing rates of eczema in the newborns. So this is just a diagram um, that shows that if you um, give an, a deworming agent to the mom, the baby has about triple the rates of eczema at one year. So here is kind of the whole story, the whole picture. If you're really interested in this, I believe it's actually an open access article. It's Brain Behavior and Immunity from Wang in April of 2014. Um, it's a really great article. It's actually their most downloaded article. This is how sexy psychobiotics are. And again, it just shows, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, um, <laughs> but it just shows all down here, all the different antibiotics, probiotics, microbiota, dietary interventions, how they inter inf influence things in the gut lumen, how that influences the immune system, and ultimately how that influences the brain, and what's the communication back. And this is sort of uh, a diagram from Rook, who's really, he has a really great textbook about this whole thing, particularly more about the helminths. And this is just this idea that what, when we really talk about what these old friends do for our immune system, is that they upregulate our T regulatory cells. And these T regulatory cells really pay, play a role in telling our other T helper cells, these main tanks of our immune system, to just cool it. You know, do not go out there, don't attack our own systems, don't attack our skin, don't attack our brains, don't attack our nervous system, don't give us MS, don't give us eczema, don't attack our lungs, don't give us um, allergies and asthma. And so these T regulatory cells are really upregulated by our old friends when they're suppressed, when our T regs are suppressed, which they are in the case when you live sort of too clean of a life, you then have this higher risk of these autoimmune diseases, and then also these psychiatric diseases, which are also regulated by inflammation, like major depressive disorder. So gut pathology, I'm going to say, equals brain pathology. There's a, big, there's a huge comorbidity or overlap between anxiety and depressive disorders and autoimmune disease. Um, there's also a huge comorbidity, again, overlap, about 60 to 80 percent between people with IBS or irritable bowel um, syndrome, which is that functional disorder. It's either diarrhea or you have constipation, you're gassy, you're uncomfortable, but you've gone to your gastroenterologist, they can't figure out a reason why, so they say, oh, you have IBS. And um, there's a huge overlap with anxiety and depression. And they actually, if you look at the CRM, they have identical chronic low-grade inflammation. I actually believe that um, IBS, anxiety disorders, and depressive disorder are basically all the same disorder. And just different people express them sort of in different phenotypes in a different way, just depending on the stress um, in your genetics and um, how you kind of cope with stress. Some people feel it really all in the gut. Um, some people, they come out with panic attacks. Some people, they will get more of a depressive disorder. So um, some other kind of cool stuff between uh, gut pathology and brain pathology. Um, there's a huge overlap between schizophrenia and celiac disease. Um, there was an enormous study of schizophrenia in the United States called the Katie trial. And in that study, they found that markers of celiac disease, your basic initial markers, um, were much, much, much higher in schizophrenics than in the general population. So one of them, IgA uh, TTG, was five times higher in schizophrenics. And, um, and actually, 23% of schizophrenics are positive for the, uh, the anti-gliadin IgA versus only 3.1% of the general population. And it's actually bi-directional. If you have schizophrenia, you have higher risk of celiac. If you have celiac disease, you have a higher risk of developing schizophrenia. And there's also a lot of studies now um, in autistic spectrum disorders, and they show a lot of gut pathology in these children. They'll have higher levels of gut pathogens like Clostridium and um, abnormal levels of gut commensals. So what do we do about it? So I said, I sort of put, played the case for this is how the gut affects the brain, this is how the brain affects the gut, and modulating some of these things might actually make us happier in our brain and less likely to develop other autoimmune disease. And so these are the different, basically the different ways that you can do it. 
Diet's a pretty strong modulator. Um, fermented foods will um, kind of act as a steady source of probiotics. <clears throat> Low carb diets will tend to favor organisms that, not surprisingly, di digest fat and protein. Higher carb diets, and particularly higher fiber diets, uh, promote some of um, the commensals that people correlate with good health, like a lot of these bifidobacterium and these lactobacillus. For some GI syndromes, however, for there's um, uh, overgrowth, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease, and those you might actually benefit from a short-term period of um, a low-carb diet, very low-carb diet, killing off some of these commensals that might, or in pathogens that might be stirring up some of these problems, and then gradually adding back some of your carbohydrates while you're um, supplementing with healthy fermented foods or probiotics, um, and that can help recover from these diseases in, a, in sort of a more long-term way. Simple carbohydrates and sugar and fructose and fructans, including those in wheat, can lead to a feeding frenzy if you have these overgrowths. Um, and there's actually plenty of studies showing that uh, people who have this uh, overgrowth, sometimes they present without any um, gastrointestinal um, problems at all, but they were come in presenting with depression. And you can actually treat this depression in these cases by put thing, putting them on this low a diet that's low in these um, carbohydrates. Probiotics only work if you're taking them, unless you've cleared, cleared out some room with antibiotics. So you don't normally just take antibiotics to clear out some room, but you might be taking them for another reason. In that case, you can take high-dose probiotics. You can, again, competitively inhibit it, any um, pathogens that are coming back, and you can kind of um, ameliorate some of the effects of antibiotics on your system. But other than that, probiotics don't tend to alter the gut flora permanently. But again, changing your diet, and then the other way to alter it permanently are your fecal transplants. Um, and fetal transplants are now being used for C. difficile and sometimes very tricky cases of IBS, um, but I can imagine, as we know more about how they affect immune, and immune system and behavior, that they might be used for other disease states. And in fact, in mice, you can actually transfer behavior around by transferring stool. In these fecal transplants, their behaviors follow the stool. So if you do your own DIY fecal transplant, which I know some people in the uh, primal paleo community are doing, I'm, be careful about that. Make sure you get it from someone who's pretty chill and pretty happy. Um, and so for antibiotics in more clinical use, um, I know some psychiatrists, who they'll test urine organic acids for uh, metabolites of pathogens and might do some directed um, antibiotics or even some herbal formulations that are sort of antibiotic. Again, clearing it out pretty carefully if you think you really do have pathogens there and then replacing with probiotics and that might help um, the disease states, anxiety or depression, get better when they couldn't get better in the state of inflammation before. So we are just getting to some of the human studies where we had the use of probiotics reducing anxiety in the context. Um, usually there are chronic fatigue or cancer or IBS. IBS has over 40 studies now of probiotics and their use. My patient comes in with IBS. I'm always pretty probiotic, uh, pretty pro probiotic for them. Um, this second study is actually really fascinating. It was a study in Japan where they had uh, people in the inpatient unit who had psychotic depression. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had any relatives who had a psychotic depression or personally had a psychotic depression. It's really the most serious kind of depression where it's so bad that um, people really lost touch with reality and it often presents people think they're possessed by the devil, they think that they're evil, they think that their organs are dissolving. It's very dangerous, there's a high rate of suicide. Often people aren't eating or drinking or taking care of themselves at all just because they're so kind of out of reality. And the only thing you can do at this point, um, antidepressants, standard antidepressants actually do not work for psychotic depression. Pretty much you have to add antipsychotic medication um, and that they can work. If that doesn't work, your only option now is actually shock therapy. Um, which is still used, it has, it has a lot of side effects, but it does work for psychotic depression and can make someone better relatively quickly. Um, however, in this study, they just used antidepressants um, and then they added a, an antibiotic, minocycline, and their patients actually got better. And what's really funny about this paper is they don't mention the microbiota at all. Um, they just thought that maybe this tetracycline antibiotic had some kind of magical effect or anti-inflammatory effect in the brain. But I think that possibly some of these people with psychotic depression had um, um, some sort of pathogen or toxin in their gut 
or possibly even in their central nervous system, and the antibiotic might have treated that, um, clearing the psychotic depression. And so these are just some others. Um, human studies, um, this fermented milk product with a probiotic modulating brain activity, that fermented milk product is actually called yogurt. Um, and so this is just, a, again, a rehash, because this is really the, sort of the key point. What can you do to kind of make your gut healthier? If you think you have an overgrowth, you start with sort of the low carb, but you want to start adding back in fiber, psyllium, acacia, inulin, and other fibers from fruits and starchy carbs to feed the healthy bacteria for the long term. So food, fermented foods and probiotics um, twice a day. The, again, the only one that really has shown um, human behavior modification is this ecologic barrier from the Netherlands. It has a lot of those bifidobacterium lactobacillus that we already talked about. Sorry, avoid too much alcohol. Um, NSAIDs like um, ibuprofen, stress, sleep deprivation, all of these things can kind of wreck your microbiota. We talked about the temporary low, low carb diet, a low FODMAP diet. Um, and again, this temporary use of certain antibiotics, and these are the neem, berberine, black walnut, um, there's a G micro X um, formulation that you can buy. They can maybe weed out these pathogens, as my friend uh, Dr. Grace likes to say. Um, and then you can seed with the probiotics to make someone feel better. So how do you modulate pseudocommensals? You can take the soil-based probiotics. Um, there's killed um, Mycobacterium vacae that you, um, they're using experimentally. One of the most interesting ways you can do this is, does anybody know what the BCG vaccine is? Right, it's used in developing countries to protect against tuberculosis. It's actually the Mycobacterium bovis. It's a cow disease, but um, you get a vaccination of it, and it acts as a chronic infection with a mycobacteria. And what's really fascinating about this is it seems to improve your cancer surveillance, and people who get this vaccine are actually 40 to 60% less likely to develop melanoma. And this is just one of the studies that shows that. Um, and here again, mycobacteria and how they use it to sort of affect um, learning and um, brain behavior. And then how do you modulate the clinical parasites? This is sort of in the far fringe of what people are doing. The parasites are really the most powerful way to affect the immune system. It's pretty unproven, and there can be some very serious side effects to these. So I would urge you, you know, to be very careful in doing this any kind of a DIY sort of way. Um, but there are fascinating results in refractory Crohn's and MS disease. There's a case study of uh, a man with OCD and Crohn's who got some of these parasites, and his OCD got better. If you look on some of the, um, there's Facebook groups, Yahoo groups, um, people who take these clinical parasites, there's lots of stories about particularly people getting better with crippling anxiety. So you'll have a kid who had ulcerative colitis, but also had panic attacks and wasn't able to attend school because he was too anxious. All of a sudden, all those panic attacks go away. When they get treated, their ulcerative colitis goes away um, when they get treated with some of these um, worms. Again, this is way too new to be trying this on yourself. Um, and I think we have a lot of studying to do to really understand these, but it's just, it's a very, they're very remarkable studies, and I just like to put it out there, um, these sort of case um, examples, so that researchers will sort of look into this more and be more excited about it. So these are not FDA approved. And this is just one of the original studies they did in using the um, pig whipworm ova in um, Crohn's disease, and these were 29 very refractory patients. They were basically, they tried everything, they were basically facing having their colons removed, which is a pretty powerful intervention, um, so why not try some parasites, some pig whipworm ova, and um, if you look, 60% um, of the patients at 12 weeks had a, a reduction, or remission, 60% had remission. So that's pretty powerful, right? These are all very difficult patients who resisted all other treatments. And again, at 24 weeks, you have 80% of them have a remission or a response. Um, this hasn't necessarily, there's been some follow-ups to this. It hasn't been as compelling as this one, but they might be using a different formulation of this uh, pig whipworm. So what's my final takeaway point here? The gut-brain connection is real. It's deeply intrinsic to the inflammatory mechanisms of depression, anxiety, and other mental illness. We're starting to develop some human evidence to suggest probiotics may be safe and effective augmenting agents for conventional therapies for anxiety and depression. 
The pseudocommensals and helmets are even more powerful interventions that need to be further researched. I hope with a little help from our friends, we can develop innovative new strategies to help defeat these mental health problems. And that's pretty much it. <coughs> Sorry. So I didn't know if there were any questions. I think they're coming with a mic. Uh, why don't you pick them? Because it's hard for me to see. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, there. Yes. Thank you for the information. Uh, in respect to what you're doing and your work here, does methylation enter into this at all? Um, it's always yes to that question, but um, I, I really do methylation more. Now I'm starting to uh, sequence people's genomes, have them do 23andMe or GeneSight or that kind of thing, and actually look at their precise methylation pathways and kind of look at it more that way. But certainly methylation is involved in sort of the stress response system and neurotransmitters and how you would react to things. Does that answer your question? Um, within the context of increasing resiliency for um, operators, special forces, military, avoiding PTSD and these chronic stress syndromes, um, you had attached gut microbiome to the anxiety, essentially, right? So IBS to anxiety. Yeah. Um, as a resiliency factor for these guys going in, when do you think we're going to have some kind of recommendation we can start tossing at them for going at this stuff? I mean, besides, you know, pick up some prescriptacist and go, do you think there's going to be any deeper, you know, piece that we can go like, hey, part of this recent, you know, this spike in the last 15 years um, is concerning PTSD. Um, could that be, you know, gut microbiota related, basically. I mean, it certainly could be, because what they really don't think it is actually combat related. Um, suicide rates in the military aren't higher in combat troops than they are in troops at home, which I find really fascinating. Um, so there's a, there's a big, huge spike in d a suicide and, and depression in the military. Some of that, again, military, the last people are going to come to you and saying, I'm suffering with depression. So there was a lot of suppression and not even talking about it. And now that they're allowed to talk about it some more, we might have an increase in diagnosis because it's just out there. Um, but that certainly wouldn't increase the suicide rate. Um, so um, I do think microbiota is a big part. And I, this is one of those things that people are really paying attention to. You know, three years ago, there were 10 papers about this. Last year, I was preparing a very similar talk for the American Psychiatric Association. And I, literally within three months, I had to add 40 and 50 more papers just to be on top of the research. And now um, there's just really exponentially more. Um, what I would like to see is more studies of parasites in young people, in children, um, and then also more of these different formulations of these uh, probiotics. Prescriptasis is one, and it can be a very useful one, but there are some that are um, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, and they're going to start, again, creating them. Um, that are specifically good for decreasing depression and anxiety, and that would be, I think, a great thing to add to pretty much anybody's regimen. Hi, I just had a question about kefir, and I'm wondering if you're familiar with it, what's, um, you know, how many strains and yeast it has in it and how it affects your gut, and what would be your recommendation for how much to consume every day? So, um, get, if you think you have some of these overgrowth, so if you have an IBS that gets worse when you take traditional probiotics, or if you take uh, kefir or kefir or um, yogurt, then you might have an overgrowth and you might want to stick with very, very low amounts. For most people, I recommend a probiotic dose, so a regular amount of kefir or yogurt, um, or probiotic pills twice a day. So I, a couple of ounces, you know, not like, you, I don't think you have to, I, I don't, honestly don't know how much is in kefir. I know kefir is a nice um, choice for people who are lactose intolerant because it doesn't have the lactose in it anymore as opposed to most regular commercial yogurts. I just need to talk. Hi, Emily. Hi. Back here. Okay. Oh, hi. Hey. 
So you've been talking a lot about probiotics. There's been you know, recent research about intermittent fasting and it really positively affecting gut microbiota. Do you see a positive association between that and mental health or are you really going or recommending that we go through the probiotic route? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting for many people. I have to say in my population of people that I treat, sort of my patients, don't have a whole lot of people who are interested in intermittent fasting um, sort of as a lifestyle or strategy um, and so I you know I think probiotics might be sort of a more palatable approach sort of for the general population which again I deal wor more with sort of on a clinical perspective than I do with the paleo population if I have a patient who's coming in um, who comes to me because they read my blog and they're really interested in these things then we talk about how intermittent fasting um, maybe a low FODMAP diet um, might um, interact with mental health. And sometimes if it's really, really obvious in my other patients, and if they're interested, um, we have a big discussion about that. But I think intermittent fasting kind of works a bit like these sort of a low carb diet or a low FODMAP diet, and it just kills off those overgrowths. You starve them out. And then if you use uh, probiotics or fermented foods, you can sort of replace them with a healthy microbiota. Um, so my two things, is, sorry. Over here. Oh, that's <laughs> Hi. Hi. Two things that seem um, <coughs> puzzling to lay people who don't study microbiota is one, why probiotics don't stick, why they don't have an ongoing effect if you stop taking them. And second, how do they have any effect at all given that they seem relatively minor as a proportion of the overall microbiome of an individual? One, that's one question. A second question, just quickly. If there was an old vanguard psychiatrist in the audience who wasn't up on this research, what would they say in response to this talk? What would be the typical opposition that you would receive if you do receive it? So how, why are probiotics so powerful? I think it's really in sort of the, again, the, the type of one because I think lactobacillus um, and bifidobacteria, I think they uh, work together. So if you already have some happy little commensals in there and then you add just a little taste of um, some new ones, uh, they can kind of, I'm not really clear on a lot of the mechanisms and I don't know that a lot of them are particularly known, but they seem to, it's sort of like two plus two equals eight instead of two plus two equals four. So it really seems to have a very profound effect in, multi in multiplying them. Um, and again, they're anti-inflammatory, so you're just giving this constant anti-inflammatory signal. Just like taking a, a low-dose aspirin has, can have a, uh, an effect on um, certain risks in the body. And that's a very small dose, but if you keep kind of doing it, you have sort of a profound anti-inflammatory effect in certain ways with, again, some other risks on the other side of that, which probiotics, you know, they haven't really found too many downsides to them. So far as what psychiatrists say, um, some of them, you know, they're just... Some of them are just going to kind of, kind of be hidebound no matter what. But I have to say of all medical doctors, psychiatrists tend to be the most interested in evolutionary medicine and sort of this approach because we don't have that many options. We have these meds which have these, sometimes they work, but they have these huge side effects and they don't, they don't work really like we would like them to. We have therapy, which a lot of people aren't really interested in. It's really difficult to get sometimes a good therapist for what you need. So, and that's kind of what we have. So if I, we're giving you all these other options. So diet, lifestyle, exercise, sleep modification. It's a whole lot of other things to talk about and they can have a very profound effect. And so they are very excited about this. And every time I do a talk at the APA, the room, there's 100 people waiting outside the door trying to get in. Um, it might be my, I often do a talks with Drew Ramsey, who's a really, really compelling speaker and really good looking. Um, so they might be coming to see him. But um, I do have to say there's a huge amount of interest among um, conventional psychiatrists in this kind of thing. Emily, my name is Kelly. I'm in the back. Hi. I'm sorry, expand on what? No, the mic's off. That's a big, 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 big question. And I think what they, you know, autism is obviously many, many different disorders that can have sort of a similar phenotype at the in, in time. Um, some of them are methylation problems. Um, 
but th there appears to be a, a very strong correlation between sort of a high amount of pathogens in the, in the gut, a lot of leak, sort of this leaky gut. Again, the, the data for this is um, not as good as we um, would hope to find, and there isn't as much interest in this in some cases as sometimes looking for the next drug to treat it. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot, people, with, uh, kids with autism often complain about stomach problems. They often have problems with um, diarrhea or constipation. Um, and they often have very strange eating habits. Um, and there are some studies showing that if you change eating habits in certain ways, um, that uh, symptoms of autism will improve. Um, so that's kind of what we have. And it may be this pathogenic gut bacteria causing these behavioral problems, causing an inability to sort of uh, detox um, heavy metals and things like that that might lead to some of these um, symptoms and syndromes. Hi. Um, so I think a mainstream psychiatrist might object that we do have pretty good psychiatric meds, uh, anti-anxiety, benzodiazepines, atypical antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, that work pretty well for a lot of these syndromes, but the assumption is that they're targeting central nervous system activity. Do you think there's a mechanism where some of those psychiatric meds might actually be targeting the gut nervous well, system or influencing probiotic um, systems? I think there's a lot of evidence that um, the antipsychotics um, seem, to inter seem to have some modulation factors in the gut. Some interesting things like there's an antipsychotic called Zyprexa that causes a tremendous amount of weight gain, but if there, you can take it actually under your tongue, there's a dissolvable formulation, the Zytus, so it doesn't go through your gut. You tend to have less weight gain with that formulation. Um, and there was a Kurt Dohan who wrote a lot about maybe how is wheat, is wheat possibly um, affecting or causing schizophrenia? And he thought that maybe antipsychotics and mechanism of how they work might be that they might actually protect the gut a little bit um, from maybe some food toxins or people are sensitive to wheat. Um, now, the, our, psychi our psychiatric meds that work best Right? They have some downsides, they can be addictive, but benzodiazepines, I can get rid of your panic attack in 30 minutes, um, pretty much guaranteed. Our stimulants work pretty well. They can definitely get you up and probably focus better, but get, they, they can have some side effects. They, we really know sort of more precisely how they work in the brain. Um, but the antidepressants might also have, I mean, they have strong serotonin effects in the guts, so that's part of why they have side effects. Um, but that's a very interesting um, place for further research. Hi. Hi, Emily, uh, at the back over here. Over here. <laughs> oh, Far there you back. are. Far back. Uh, you mentioned the temporary use of low-carb diets to, uh, to kind of cut down on some of the bacterial overgrowth. Um, I think most of us here on the paleo diet, which is kind of inherently lower carb. So how do you feel about the prolonged use of a low carb diet? And are there any risks of having kind of like a diminished microfloral uh, diversity and that kind of thing? So I'm actually a big fan of even a ketogenic diet. When we have some of these syndromes like dementia, maybe even schizophrenia, maybe autism, um, a very, very, very low carb, a ketogenic diet. I, I would love to see further studies with these because I think there's some evidence that it might be very helpful in these conditions. Um, however, I do think that there is a risk to the sort of a healthy gut microbiota by having an extended low carb diet. Um, and I'd really want to know more about that before um, we sort of went forward with prescribing these diets or, or, or maybe assist these um, people on these low carb diets with some fibers that we could add to it to feed their gut. Um, bacteria to be sort of more on the healthy side. Um, you know, it's hard to say because people that are studied with high carb, with high fat diets, or mice that are studied with high fat diets, the literature, they're eating high fat crap Western diets and they have crappy microbiota uh, profile. Um, and the people who are eating sort of our so called healthy diet, they tend to be more on the um, low, f the sort of the so called healthy low fat diets. Um, so I think there's some more research to be done. But I do think if, if, Low-carb diets have an Achilles heel. It may be how they affect, chronically, how they affect the uh, microbiota. I'm also a good, uh, a big proponent of having a lots of variation in foods that you can eat. And if you're able to eat a little bit of a higher-carb diet, I think that gives you um, kind of more different things that you can eat all the time. But it's just kind of me being careful. 
Um, um, hi. Oh. No, go, go ahead. Oh. Dr. Deans, um, do you have an opinion about, um, I'm back here in the middle. Okay. <laughs> free glutamates, all the free glutamates that are in food and disguised under lots of other names um, in terms of glutamates being neurotoxins and uh, having implications in autism, Alzheimer's, and lots of neurological conditions. You mean the delicious umami that... And umami, right. <laughs> um, so, you know, I haven't seen... Uh, I, certainly when I've seen in autism protocols, the sort of functional medicine autism protocols, they will try to limit these. And I think there may well be people who are very sensitive to them, um, people who may have problems with um, metabolizing neurotransmitters in certain ways or, or, or changing um, glutamates. But sometimes the same glutamate um, or glutathione can be made into glutamate. It can be made um, into, glut you know, the, all these things they can transfer back and forth all the time. So I think that in this healthy system, um, as long as you're not just torching all of your food with MH MSG, um, I, I think probably a lot of us are resilient to some of the, I haven't seen people who come in and definitely they're like, oh my God, you know, I'm depressed and really anxious now just because I ate um, a lot of glutamate. So I, I personally have not seen a lot of evidence for that, but I do, I would certainly believe that there are certain people who would be much more sensitive to them. So, um, I'm, I'm back here, the other side. Hi. Um, so, so I got a whole spectrum of autoimmune disorders all at the same time. Mm -hmm. and it was while I was traveling to Nepal. Um, and I've looked at like microbiome biome sequencing like services and things like that. I was wondering if you think that those are a good idea or I, I have no idea how to diagnose what, what's going on. I've, I've tried kefir, I've tried different things and they seem to control it but I don't know how to identify what I actually need to do. Well, one thing would be to make sure you had a stool test for parasites. Um, and you can get, a, what is it, Genova Diagnostics will give, um, if you can go to a practitioner, a lot of practitioners will um, do a Genova Diagnostics. It'll give you a stool profile and it'll test you for parasites. If you go to your gastroenterologist, they can do a stool test for parasites. Um, and they may, they may do, you, also available, I think, um, my friend, Dr. Grace, really likes the U-biome the best of all the different profiles that you can get. There's American gut, there's all these things, but she's very fond of the U-biome. So I don't have any connection with any of these. Um, I don't receive payment from any of these places um, to recommend them, but those are just the different options that are out there. Sort of like there's a, for ge your genome, you can go 23andMe. Maybe you're worried about the privacy, so maybe do Ancestry.com. Um, those are just the different options. So I would do U-biome and see if you can get someone who, to prescribe maybe the Genova test. And you know, ask your doctor about checking your stool for parasites. Hi, I'm over here. Um, I have a question about when you do the low-carb diet to reset your microbiome. Um, and this also goes into conventional psychiatry. Um, I put my son on a low-carb diet with his bipolar diagnosis and after many years, no, not a single person suggested that to us. So in your experience, have you found that folks with like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder are less needing meds when they've gone with like strong dietary changes besides just the symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of cases of people with pretty serious, one of them's bipolar, one of them's psychotic disorder, um, and they are tremendously better if they eat a very clean diet also um, tend to watch their sleep, because sleep's also very important in bipolar disorder. Um, one person turned out to have celiac disease, and that's pretty much cured their psychotic disorder when they um, went on a gluten-free diet, but they actually be diagnosed with celiac disease. I didn't, I wasn't the one who picked it up, but they came to me after the fact. Um, there are some case studies in the literature, very positive case studies for ketogenic diets and bipolar disorder in um, helping them, and so a low-carb, modified low-carb diet can sometimes be uh, ketogenic. And um, I think there's lots of science to back that uh, a ketogenic diet might help because they're very, the way the ketogenic diet works in the brain is very similar to a lot of our mood-stabilizing medications. Um, so like our Depakote or our Lamotrigine, um, uh, these medications just work in the same way and does some of the same things that a ketogenic diet will do in the brain. So it would be a, um, something to 
that might be useful for bipolar disorder. I know they're trying to get studies together for that, but they can't, it's really hard to convince people to go on a ketogenic diet uh, for bipolar disorder or other disorders. T people tend to be interested um, and try to come in from the outside or they're desperate or they're willing to try anything um, and they don't all tend to you know, cluster around an academic medical center to do these actual studies. I do wish we had a lot more data of that. Hello? Hello? It looks like we have five minutes, so yes? Um, thank you very much for your talk. I'm back on the left. Uh, I know in a lot of uh, psychiatrists, there's a growing number of psychiatrists that feel the same way that you do about the gut-brain axis. Um, but I know many of them do not put it on their website. <laughs> so and they have a website. <laughs> um, what uh, what do you suggest, or how do you suggest finding other uh, psychiatrists that feel the same way as you do about their gut brain axis? So, if you look on, um, I think the Primal Physicians Network or the Paleo Physicians Network. I think it's probably Primal Docs and Paleo Physicians Network, or there's an Ancestral. Um, health Physicians Network. If you Google some of these, you'll find different practitioners that are very interested in it. I know a high percentage of the doctors I know, and not just because I'm a psychiatrist, I actually met them through PaleoFX or I met them at the Ancestral Health Convention. Um, a high percentage of them are actually psychiatrists. So it's, you may not be able to find a gastroenterologist who's really into this, but um, it's a little easier to find a psychiatrist who's into this as long as you're willing to travel um, a few hours. In terms of mental illness and sleep, do you find that sleeping problems, is it the chicken or the egg? And I'm, I'm back where the last question was. Oh, okay. So sleeping problems, how do you get your patients to sleep better and is that what's causing the problem or is that just a symptom of the problem? Yes. So it's, all, it's, it's definitely bi-directional. Um, ADHD is a perfect example. Kids with ADHD generally do not sleep as well as kids who don't have ADHD. If you improve that sleep, you can often improve behaviors. It's extreme of this is sometimes you can cure oppositional defiant um, behaviors and sometimes um, ADHD in kids when they find that they have um, really large tonsils and adenoids and they actually um, have sleep apnea at night and they take them out and their behavior gets a lot better. Um, but the opposite is also true if you're uh, ADHD kids just tend to be wired that they just don't sleep as well as other kids. So it's, it's sort of this vicious cycle. And um, how do I modify anybody's behavior? Um, you can really only do that sort of a smart way. I use um, motivational interviewing, which is sort of a studied way to kind of modulate someone's behavior, which is you just kind of listen to them where they are. I don't tend to do this sort of thing. I don't proselytize. Um, I don't say, well, you know, if you ate this way, then you would definitely be feeling better. I would say, oh, you know, if someone comes to me, they're complaining that um, they really just feel rotten on the weekend when they wake up, and maybe they're not drinking six beers a night or, 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 or something the night before. Maybe they just are going to bed really late and they're sleeping late. I say, well, did you ever think, you know when you wake up at 8 a.m. and you wake up the first time and you get up and you feel really energized and you feel really, really good? And um, they'll say, hey, yeah, occasionally, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I said, when you sleep to 11, don't you feel kind of hot and gross and kind of like that last, you sort of feel like you just want to go back to bed and you also feel like you wasted half the day? Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Um, and sort of hear about what they're talking about and try to really do these tiny interventions based on their very personal experience. And that's the only way that I think you're successful in motivating people. And some people, they just have no interest. They're like, no, I like the way I sleep. Okay. The next time they come in, if you hear a little hint that they might want to um, do some change in some area, you can just press that little place there. And that's how I tend to motivate behaviors and, and try to change behaviors in my patient population without wasting too much of my energy and becoming frustrated. Hi. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I was just curious if you've had much experience with your patients doing fecal transplants and being able to heal their IBS or their anxiety. And I know it would be a DIY process because it's only approved for C. diff, but I just didn't know if you had any personal experience with that. Um, I do have a few patients who have, um, it didn't work. Um, and again, I would be pretty cautious because I think you can transfer things like hepatitis C and um, some other kind of nasty diseases. So I'd be very careful about, you know, approaching some good-looking person on the internet and asking them for their stool. 
because um, you really, I mean, what they really do is a protocol that's similar to what they do for Mass General, where they have a, a registry of stool donors. They do a protocol that's similar of testing people for their blood. So um, people who are kind of healthy enough to give blood, they think are healthy enough for, I think they test their stool as well. But I know um, there's a company in um, Med, Medway, Mass, or Medford, Massachusetts, and they um, only accept like four or five percent of the people who um, agree to donate stool to them. They also pay them a great deal of money to donate stool, um, but they only accept maybe five percent of their applicants. All right, we are done. Thank you very much.